Hi everybody. Welcome to Ordinary Differential Equations, the mathematical framework and tools for understanding, modeling, and predicting anything that moves. Hi, welcome back to Ordinary Differential Equations. We're going to start Chapter 6 now, and the main idea in this chapter is to learn about the implications of hyperbolicity for equilibrium points for the full nonlinear vector fields. Okay, so the title is Stable and Unstable Manifolds of Equilibria. We're going to do a little bit more than that, but uh, actually it is, as we will learn at the very end, a complete description of what we're going to do in this chapter. But we're going to do it in great detail for two-dimensional vector fields. And this just is my, um, along, goes along with my philosophy of understanding simple examples really thoroughly first before you go to the more complicated, i.e. higher dimensional settings. So the vector field is x dot equals f of x and y, y dot equals g of x and y. We assume it's CR, r greater than or equal to 1. So we can differentiate it and the derivative is continuous. We have to do that if we're going to compute Jacobians and look at hyperbolicity. And we're going to denote the flow generated by this, this vector field in the usual way. Phi sub t and parentheses with a placeholder inside for the initial condition, the point in phase space for which we want to look at the trajectory through that point. Okay, now we're going to suppose x naught y naught is an equilibrium point, and the Jacobian of the vector field at that equilibrium point, so the matrix associated with the linearization of the vector field at the, at the equilibrium point is given by this expression. And if the vector field, if the equilibrium point is hyperbolic, there are three cases to consider. The vector field is a source, for the linearized vector field. So both eigenvalues of the Jacobian have positive real part. x naught, y naught is a sink for the linearized vector field. So both eigenvalues have real parts negative. And the last case is if x naught, y naught is a saddle for the linearized vector field, both eigenvalues are real and opposite in sign. Okay, and we're going to look at each case individually. The source, the sink, and then the saddle we're going to spend a lot more time on. So one little throwaway comment that I'll come back to is x, y are my original coordinates for describing the vector field. Obvious, but we'll come back to that in a little bit. So the first thing to, uh, first situation to consider, suppose x naught, y naught is a source for the linear vector field. Okay, the result is for the nonlinear vector field that it's also a source for the nonlinear vector field. That is a whole point of hyperbolicity. The linearized behavior goes over to the full nonlinear dynamics when you consider the higher order terms, not just the linear terms. Okay, so, and that, we're not going to prove that in this chapter. We'll learn the necessary techniques when we learn about Lyapunov's method, but uh, probably the most accessible reference that will prove these uh, at your level is the excellent book by Hirsch, Smale, and Devaney that I have over here. The book by Katak and Hasselblad up here is a fantastic book, but it's a fairly advanced book. Okay, so if we have a source for the linear approximation, a hyperbolic source, which I've just defined, then the result is that it's also a source for the full nonlinear equations. That is for 6.1, not just the linear approximation about the equilibrium point. So what that means is there exists a neighborhood, we call it script U, of the point, such that for any point 
in that neighborhood, phi t of p, the trajectory through p, leaves that neighborhood as t increases. So a source. You leave the neighborhood of the equilibrium point. Okay, a sink. Well, the result is if you have a sink, a hyperbolic sink in the linear approximation, then it's also a sink for the nonlinear equations. Now, what that means, what does it mean? For, it means you can find a neighborhood, we're going to call it S now, of x naught, y naught, such that for any point in that neighborhood, phi sub t of p approaches the equilibrium point at an exponential rate. And if you think back to the, the examples from the last chapter, you know exactly what I mean by that, hopefully. So in this case, x naught, y naught is an example of an attracting set. So it would have a basin of attraction. And this is what the basin of attraction is. Now, when I show students this the first time, they're, they're a little bit puzzled, understandably. So what does it mean? Take our neighborhood S. And so that our that's, the, that's the neighborhood so that all points in that neighborhood actually approach at an exponential rate the equilibrium point x naught y naught. So what, we, what do we do? I'll say it in a couple of ways. We let s f evolve under the flow in backwards time for all time, and we take the union over all backwards time. So what does that really mean? Well, take S and ask where does where does where did S come from in the past? Look at all the points in the phase space that will evolve to S as time goes, as time grows, as time becomes positive, as time goes to infinity. So in order to find that, we need to take S and let it evolve in backwards time. Look at all the regions of the phase space through which S evolves under the flow, letting it flow backwards, and take take them all, take the union. That's the that's the the mathematical expression for what I mean by that. Okay, and that's the basin of attraction. And interestingly, that's exactly what you would do with a computer if you're going to compute this object, but. We'll see examples of this later, this uh, basin of attraction, the concrete examples in this chapter later on. Now, the last example is the saddle, and that takes a little more time to introduce. So I will stop right here and pick up next time with the hyperbolic saddle and the na nature of the linear behavior near the saddle and the nonlinear behavior near the saddle. And that's where we're going to get the notion of stable and unstable manifolds. And I have to answer this question, where did this word manifold come from for the first time in the course? Okay, enough for now, and I'll see you next time. Bye.